Umra Omar's contribution to community and transforming the lives of others is a remarkable story. Born on the remote Pate Island just off the northern coast of Kenya, she grew up in Nairobi and pursued higher education in the United States. Umra earned a bachelor's degree in neuroscience and psychology and then a master's degree in social justice and intercultural relations from the World Leading Institute in Vermont. Her early career took her to Washington, D.C., but a strong sense of duty drew her back to Kenya. In 2015, during a visit to her hometown, Umra recognised the dire need for healthcare in her community and founded Safari Doctors. Safari Doctors operates mobile clinics across Kenya, reaching over 1,000 patients a month through boats, motorcycles and on foot. Umra's incredible work has seen her named as the UN Person of the Year in Kenya and received the Africa Leaders for Change Award. She was recognized by the World Economic Forum as a young global leader, a CNN top 10 hero, and featured in Business Daily's top 40 under 40 women. A mother of two who splits her time between Portugal and Kenya. Umar, it's a great pleasure to meet you. I've heard an incredible amount about you, and congratulations on the difference that you're making. Thank you, Luke, and I've heard so much about you and your football uh, geniusness, so (laughs) a mutual feeling. Uh, that's that's high praise. I, I, I'm very uh, happy to keep it there and not show you any videos um, uh, that might uh, underwhelm you. But I understand Safari Doctors began with you wanting to make a difference in people's well-being. Can you tell us about that story and your passion for making a difference? The Safari Doctors um, in Lamu, Kenya, it, it kind of like found me, I guess. Um, it combined all my passion. It was home, it was healthcare, it was travel as well, and uh, making a difference in a tiny way. So the idea was just to um, mobilize something on a monthly basis, support a nurse who travels around um, five villages and get, gets access on the ground like to the people. Because one of the things that is really unfortunate for us women and for our children is that health is a part of our daily existence versus um, waiting to get sick. So if you're talking of immunizations or you're fam- accessing family planning and so forth, it's more of a way of life. So how do you get it to the doorsteps is what Safari Doctors was about. So it, was, it started off as a pet project of just making a tiny difference at home and then took a life of its own. And I love these words that are attributed to you, Umra. Consistency, persistence, and dedication are what water this suit of purpose into a tree. And before you know it, you are part of a forest of, tra- of change. Can you explain why that means so much to you? It means so much to me because it's a reflection of when we look at a seed. If you look at a seed, it's like this, just this tiny little something. And then what people come to see is when they're eating the fruits of it. And when you're like, you know, you have a tree or a bush and it's like, oh my God, this is amazing. But you're like, actually, it, it started as a seed. And, and what what is the seed that defines us? Um, and not being overwhelmed by thinking of, okay, we have to become this huge mango tree or this huge bush, but just being focused on nurturing that small seed. And then so many things come together, The whether it's the weather coming together, it's the soil. So that's how we are as humans and in the work that we do. And for me, that's what really helps me not get too overwhelmed about what we're doing. It's like, do your part, Umrah, and then the rest will take care of itself. And that's what happened with Safari Doctors. That's what's happening. That's what happens with raising kids. You don't get a manual told, okay, this is how your adult would look like. Therefore, do this today, this tomorrow. So that that's the philosophy um, around that consistency. It's because of you have to pace yourself knowing that what you're a part of is much bigger than yourself. So just do your part. And you mentioned raising kids and and you're a mother of two. And and do you you take that same approach to you that you you really just in in every day you can do small things and hopefully at the end that you've made the contribution you want to your own family? It's because you know, you trust in that DNA, what makes you up and you do what you can because or else it's kind of, you know, like moving country. Someone's like, you know, so what's your plan? What are you, you know, in five years, three years? I'm like, it's, I know there's something bigger that this is a journey of, and sometimes you can define what your where you're headed. Sometimes you just open, um, uh, trusting that the steps that you're taking um, in your leadership journey, in your parenthood journey, in your workspaces, that um, being open to what's unfolding and trusting that you're you're wired to go through that. 
When they say helping others may be the secret to living a life that's not only happier, but also healthier, wealthier, more productive and meaningful. Your life I look at as this great life of, of contribution to others. Is that how it's felt to you? I felt very blessed, Luke, very, very blessed in terms of almost living my life in, in reverse. You know, how you work, build your career, you retire and then make a difference. And then you give back or you do something, a tragedy happens, and then that drives you to, you know, um, to make make that impact. So for me, after a year and a half of, of employment, I was blessed in that I had that set up, whether it was a family or being back home or um, being able to have a purpose find me earlier on in life and being able to commit to that. Um, to make my work, work be around that, to raise a family around that, to build a team around that. And then now is when I'm like, oh, you know, that, that's kind of what people do when you retire or when you're like, oh, I have time. And so it's, it's in absolute reverse. So being able to have found um, that space that felt like I was making a difference at the same time I could um, grow as an individual, learn and build a career out of um, uh, humanitarian work. I think that that's a very nice space to be in. I love how you say that that work found you. I, I mentioned you, your study and your master's degree in the US and you worked in Washington, DC. So you had mm-hmm. that opportunity to take that path that a lot of, a lot of people do, isn't it? Work for themselves and maybe build out the, the passions that support your life. But Something drew you, I think, as you said, in reverse to be able to find purpose and then reverse engineer that. Was there a temptation for you to stay in the US and continue that path or did it never feel quite right for you? I remember I did an interview once in college and I was asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was like, out of nowhere, I was like, I want to be a bridge. Um, And I always had that. I used to have these dreams when I was a kid, which were really weird um, because I was raised by my grandma. And so, but then we moved to Nairobi with my parents later on. And I would dream there was this alleyway that we would play. And the moment I walked through it, I was in my grandma's backyard. And so I really looked forward to going to bed. I was like, this only happens when I'm sleeping. And that then translated to wanting to be a bridge was like, okay, there's this very like driven, ambitious, Western civilized, like pace and world career. And, you know, the I, I, I talk of capitalism, like on steroids. And then at the same time, there was that core wiring of this like communal space where anything that you do, however small can make a big difference. So over time, being able to be able to like um, transit between these different worlds, bring the best from each to the other is, 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 it has been my dream um, setup. So it, it worked out eventually. I didn't know how it would work out. In my head, I thought it would be maybe having a job at like the World Health Organization and, you know, being posted in different places for, for a while. But it actually turned out in a very organic role um, way that I could define myself in my terms and, uh, and, and build an organization around it. It's fascinating to say it literally was your dream as a young girl to actually see yourself in that light and then to be able to say those words in college must have been interesting for you. You grew up on a tiny island of 3,000 people, I think surrounded by mangroves. Is it sort of unique to think you can come back with all of that expertise mm-hmm. and knowledge and be that bridge in life? As you said, it's it's turned out in a way that maybe you couldn't have imagined, but do you think mm-hmm. that was always your destiny? It, it, it's. I feel like we all have – an idea of what we dream or desire or feel like you're destined to. And then now it's just along the way, navigating the noise and the background chaos, you know, like the, the echo that we had um, setting up the podcast. And it's quite hard. You know, you go, you, you kind of really have to play, okay, let's log out, let's log back in, let's figure it out until you fine tune to, to, you know, what it is uh, that's that safe space, that uh, purposeful space for you. So it was, I, I, I just feel very, very fortunate that, um, to, uh, I could define this journey for myself. And Norma, we feel incredibly uh, privileged to have been able to collaborate with you in a, a world called Elite Connect that we're really passionate about uh, curating groups of people from different backgrounds that maybe wouldn't have uh, got together. And I love your group because I'm sure this group of people would never 
have uh, connected from uh, Paul Barnes from McLaren Racing in Formula One and Carlos Custa from uh, Arsenal. Nico Kane is a CEO of a, of a huge organisation and an amazing story. Justin Longmuir, an Australian rules football coach in, in Fremantle in Australia. And, uh, and your incredible story. Can you tell us about uh, you know, sitting down with that group on a regular basis and what that's uh, meant for you? At first, I was a little skeptical of the Elite Connect group, I won't lie. I was like, hmm, you know, uh, here I am, this uh, African girl villager, and here are like, you know, five other senior white male officials working in all these different fields. So I was like, oh, my friend's like, no, it's an amazing process. It's going to unlock, like, you know, thoughts and spaces you didn't know existed. And Matt was really cool. Stephanie was just fantastic. Um, so like seven, I think we're seven sessions in or something. It's It defines the word creativity for me. So when I looked up the word creativity to understand it, it defines it as the ability to like see connections where none seem to exist. And I think that's the magic of um, Alida, what it did. And sure enough, here we are, we said, you know, there's um, there's a football component, here's Arsenal. You know, we you, we run um, healthcare and we use football as a tool of communicating to young men um, and girls around sexual and reproductive rights, you know. So I'm like, oh, that's really... That's really random. And then the most random personal connection comes with Paul. I'm like, Paul in Formula One, like logistics. I'm like, okay, our life is around logistics and healthcare. And then you're learning about this person, like moving hundreds of people across the globe. And then I'm like, Formula One, what are the chances? My son is karting. He's in motorsports. He's like, we're like McLaren fans. You know, we have the, the hats cheering and I'm always rooting for Lando. So it was like really a, an interesting space um, to be in and having these um, platforms of like, not just leadership discussion, but like the back end of leadership. I think it's the part that, you know, when they say it's a lonely space and uh, having this intimate group that's very intentional, open to being vulnerable and you can like bounce um, your challenges with as well was a very critical tool. So Alida was definitely not my usual, you know, workshop panels like (laughs) humanitarian spaces, but more of an intentional um, um, dissection of uh, leadership. So, yeah. It's a beautiful description, Numbra, and I, I just, you know, the way that you've described those uh, connections and, and the different thinking and people being open-minded, we often talk about people for a long time have been in our silos and we work in our spaces mm-hmm. and we end up with a, that group think often to great effect, but when you put that random uh, creativity as you described it, it, it can be quite powerful and it, it sounds as though that's something that sort of really resonated with you. That was a big takeaway for me. And uh, just that urge, we had one session with, I think his name was Ben, uh, the the conductor of the of the orchestra. Ben Northey, who's the um, conductor of the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, is a, a beautiful creative guy. Ben, he dropped into your group, did he, Umra? It, it, was, it, it was very insightful. I went to a college that was um, an um, Oberlin college around music and not in a single you know, million years would I have thought that, okay, here's <laughs> here's something that can show you linkages of no different than what we were doing on a field hockey pitch. Like I played field hockey and I'm like, you know, from orchestra on the stage or field hockey or going to um, uh, to any part of the world. It, it was a very powerful um, illustration of uh, teamwork and leadership. Umar, I read that you come from a family of very progressive men that have nurtured the strong women in your world and that there was a lot of misconception about, uh, in your words, your community. Can you tell us a bit about those strong men and, and the misconceptions of your community that they have perhaps broken the, the trend from? My father is the biggest feminist I know and, and before feminism existed. Um, here's a man the most, you know, eligible bachelor in town, politician, and, you know, is like advanced in his space. And he achieved all this, you know, as a self-made person to then go and marry. And the first thing he does is get married, delays having kids, which is abnormal, because usually that would be a really bad reputation, you know, being called. Um, And then the first thing he did was send my mom to school. 
Um, and not just to school, but to Rockford, Illinois, in the United States, for like away from these two young kids. And so everyone called my parents like crazy, like these are the craziest human beings. You know, how does a man get a young, beautiful wife and then like send her away? And then here's this two young kids, how reckless. And that was like the biggest investment um, that could ever happen. And especially with three girls, uh, with three girls, no, no boys um, at home. And then that goes back, though, to looking at my grandma. She's like this strong 95-year-old lady who's like a matriarch. And at 5 a.m. in her house, it's like just men having coffee. At 5 p.m. after their, uh, before the evening prayers, it's these men having coffee. So we come from a society that um, is honestly very matriarchal. Um, as much as we don't like to admit it. Um, and But now when you look at the impact of colonialism, when you look at the impact of the, um, the Islamic influence that came of, you know, putting putting societies into boxes, check boxes, defining whether it's what went into our constitution, what went into the prayers, is that oh, that's where I feel like the patriarchy um, kind of starts uh, diluting in. But if we look at other societies, like in Kenya, we have the Kikuyu community where men take their mother's names as last names, for example. But you don't hear that being talked about because there's all this narrative of, you know, we got to fix this. There must be um, a gender issue here and so forth. So for on my end, I, I'm just very um, aware of the fact that we, we cannot take a broad stroke on some of these social issues, we do have to point out the nuances, whether it's matriarchy, whether it's these strong men who are actually um, carry women on their shoulders for the next generation. Um, and I've seen that a lot um, growing up. And maybe that's why it's coming with the, you know, you can't tell me no, you can't tell me that you can't, uh, you know, do this. And I try to do the same with the kids. I remember being told I couldn't swim. I'm like, you know what, I'm going to swim and I'm going to be the best swimmer that, I, <laughs> that that there is in school. And and that happened. And so having more and more of these narratives come to the forefront, look, I think is very critical. Well, we're in Australia at the moment, there is a horrific ep epidemic of violence against women. It's a, a national disgrace, I think, is a term a lot of us use. And these violent acts that are happening on a regular basis, as you said, it's such a complex and nuanced conversation that, you you know, growing up in a loving family and having what you described as as a father and a mother, and, and you find it almost hard to comprehend. And do you think, you know, we don't tell the stories like, the progressiveness of your dad enough mm -hmm. and that we perhaps focus on the alternative sometimes is there part of the solution in that for what is a really complex and horrible problem it, it, it's it is part of the solution i mean if you don't see more of such a reality then you're wired to think that it's not possible or it doesn't exist whether it's in sports um you're talking domestic violence we just had a meeting a very interesting meeting this morning with the political leaders around reproductive health um as part of safari doctors program and one of the guys said something very important whenever he's like whenever we talk family planning we just think women and, and maybe that's the problem is that men need to be actively engaged to know that they're part of this situation as well. So if you're coming home and you just want your wife popping babies every one year, but you don't understand the physiology of a woman, what she's going through, what needs to happen, then th that will always be a problem you're addressing just like a, a, a one end of it and there's a hole at the end of the bucket and you're just filling water saying, you know, we're, we're, we're doing this. So if you look at issues of especially domestic violence, um, a lot of, of the cases, and I don't have the stats to, to kind of spew out, is that you'd see either it's like a historic, it's somebody who's witnessed it before in their family. It's kind of, there's this linear um, progression around it of what someone experiences as familiar and then how they deal with it, whether it's what they saw their mother go through or or somebody within their closed space go through. So, so that's one of the tools is being like, this does not have to be um, uh, the how love is expressed. Like we've done surveys in communities where Women are like, you know, if I burn the food, I should be beaten. You know, what am I doing burning the food? But 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 that that's a basic understanding where it's like, no, it doesn't 
It doesn't have to be that way. And it has to happen to both parties. Because the same guys who are perpetuating the violence, again, are coming from a history of violence, a lot of them. So, so I think having these stories, what you're doing, what you guys do, is like getting information stories out there, realities out there, um, that is, is one of the elements that we need to tackle. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing to be able to share stories like yours and it feels like the world hasn't had too much space for that, isn't it? That you, you, The nightly news tells stories of, of grim and horror and uh, the algorithms tend to work towards the negative bias, don't they? And it's a fight back, isn't it, to hear. And the media is so responsible for this because it's like, you know, anything, every time I'm always scrolling down, it's like gory stories or, you know, this happened, somebody got killed or so and so. It's, it's, it's just, and that's an unfortunate space as well, that kind of this room for improvement. Yeah. You know, the story of how progressive your grandfather must have been and your dad at that time is in, incredibly uh, inspiring. And you also founded a school to serve the local families where you grew up. But I, I think when I read that, a lot of us have great intentions, but not many people get serious things done like you do. What, what sets you apart in that way? How do you find a way, as you said, to get that seed to grow into the beautiful tree that provides fruit, as you describe? What, what sets you apart? Somebody like, you know, give Omar a problem and the first thing she wants to do is fix it. <laughs> um, maybe it's that male quality um, uh, that they call. But it, I don't know. I just feel like humans are we're very powerful. I think when I think of all the great, you know, us being able to have this conversation, you think of people who've done so much more. You know, you think of the Graham Bells and the Einsteins and you're like, oh, my God. You think of Mansa Musa and, you know, the, the pyramids. I don't know. I go into those weird spaces where, like, and therefore what we're trying to do is, like, nothing. It's absolutely nothing. I'm like, you know, there's somebody um, who was sailing the seas back in the day without Google Maps. I'm like, wow, now that's impressive. Um, so we were home and Safari Doctors, after a year, I think I realized that it's no longer um, – like a pet project that I could do from Nairobi or New York. And I had a 10 year old boy, not, not 10 years. He was, he's 10 years now. He was 10 months then. And he hated going to school. He loved it. The first two days it was exciting. And then after that, I would like have to sneak around and like walk him halfway and then like disappear from an alley or, you know, get a donkey home and be like, hey, guess what? Today you're going to school with a donkey. And then it, it was just, I say every morning, I'm so happy to be here as an adult, but my son is like so miserable um, at the idea of going to school. So then that's when three of us parents got together who wanted our kids to have more of an experiential learning education versus sitting in a classroom and looking at a blackboard. How could they be in a space where they could interact with nature, they could learn colors by walking around and, you know, as opposed to from a textbook. Um, uh, and then, so there was a space and we shoved three of them and then neighbor's kids join in, somebody else kid join in. And I thought it would be just, um, like a homeschooling experience where three of us got in, got a teacher or two and uh, taught in some subjects. And now we have 50 kids. Um, my son and my daughter, um, were able to transition from that school to like one of the most competitive like international schools. It's like, oh, so we must be doing something, right? It, it can't be that bad. Because everyone was like, they don't learn there. They're just playing and having too much fun. So that's how we have a school called Shambhala Shela, which is um, in my front yard back at home in Lamu. And we now have seven teachers and uh, five staff members. So it's kids coming in from 8.30 with a full meal until end of the day they get to do all these random village experiences but also global experiences so being able to take like seven eight kids take them to get passports and travel out of the country um you know creating random opportunities have a swimming program because i really believe in swimming and how much it did for me so that's the little vision that translated into um this exciting so i look forward to retiring and having like 50 kids running in the compound <laughs> i love someone who's got a master's degree from one of the leading education institutes in the world sees the beauty in the creativity of letting kids play and learn in a different way it's a it's another great story i've had great privilege of sitting across from incredible people like you and we think that success leaves clues and that there are some patterns in 
in leadership. I want to ask you a handful of questions on that uh, basis. So starting with self-leadership, we feel hard to do what you do or what anyone who achieves like you have without a sense of self-leadership. What does that t- term mean to you? I'm going to ask you as an athlete, <laughs> I spin it on your table. How do you go from like athletics and having the discipline to have a podcast and just sit around uh, doing research about all that? That's a lot of self-leadership. Well, what, that's a, what, what drives you to do that? Let me spin this one. It's a, it's a lot easier asking the questions than answering as it turns out, uh, Umra. But uh, yeah, I think probably the discipline of sport gave me that belief to get out of bed and I, I'm, the morning routine I feel for me has been something that's held me in good stead by getting up and being active and exercising and then starting the day in a positive way and building on those little moments that then that discipline for me has turned out uh, beneficial in other areas of being able to follow through and do things because sport gave you that um, mm-hmm. ability to be able to do that and take on board feedback and want to be a constant learner and want to constantly improve and I feel uh, athletes probably misunderstand that. They they get to the end of their life and then their sporting life and they go, I know nothing. And often you do, but I think you take some of that uh, mm-hmm. in your life. So that for me is that self-leadership of starting the day with good habits and good routines that sets me up for the rest of the day. Um, how about you? That's that's very true with athleticism, having um, having swum earlier and then picked up field hockey and then seeing it in my son as well. Um, trying like I can see the difference, so that that that's definitely a component. On my end, more severely though, I is like I have a serious allergy to injustice, like super allergic to that. I'm talking, I will not be quiet, and I think for me that's what pushes me to kind of maybe it's almost like proving a point that you know you say whether it's like oh as women you can't or shouldn't be able to do this. I'm like that invoke some serious self-leadership to prove otherwise um you're talking about oh you know you talk about race you talk about nationalism you bring it but for me it's like it really puts up that fire and uh, especially in like seeing it for the next generation because i feel like we're, we're almost in that phase of it's no longer about aspiring but about um uh, transmitting before then checking out and being like okay you've done what you've done um so also the young the next generation is really um inspiring it it drives me to um have that um push of okay we need to pass that baton um on you need to be on top of your stuff you need to be that role model you need to expand the boundaries so something like uh, in 2022 um, we ran for office and everyone's like, you know, you're not a politician. You've never, um, you, there's a lot of old guards, but it, it's like that, that, that discipline of mobilizing resources, getting a team, being like almost a, a small band because we're like a non-starter, the underdogs. For me, yeah, I'm driven by the self-leadership for me is because of the underdog, basically. Yeah, I love uh, what an uh, incredible answer. We, we see people are really conscious now of how they positively impact others in their environment. And that sounds like the most uh, ridiculous question to ask someone who impacts people the way you do. But do you think about that on a daily basis, that the people you interact with and how you go about impacting people? Is that something you're conscious of every day? No, I don't think it's like um, a mantra or I start a meditation, but like, okay, these are the five things I'm going to work on today or push. I think it's just a way of life. You know, the same way you don't get up and think, oh, I'm a man. Um, what do I do when I go take a piss today? Like you, you just, it just happens. Um, so it, it's the same. It's just, it's just a, it's a space. It's a way. Sometimes you need to put yourself in check, especially when you're getting like, a battery low when you're like you feel like you're drained i think it's it's one of the hardest spaces in in athletics it's when you're losing um you know there's that point where you're like okay then you need to be more conscious about it you're like okay you know what this is the purpose you got this or here's where you turn to for um uh, refueling and recharging and everything but otherwise you just walk on it and it's the triggers that come around, you know, sometimes, what was it? I saw somebody like they cutting the line. I'm like, I think he's cutting that line and we're just going to watch them cut the line like that. And you, you go tap them in the shoulder and they're like, you're really going to call me out. So it's, it's, it's just in you. 
and, and that shows up in those little moments too. Like if there's any injustice, you can't be silent. You, you'll, yeah. you'll pull someone into the line who's pushing in the line. They're, go- they're going back. <laughs> I wouldn't cross uh, Umar Omar, I think. Uh, I think yeah, it would be in a nice way because then we'd still joke about it and maybe even ha- like have a cup of tea um, later on. But it, And that's, the, uh, that's just the other thing, though, is also how do you navigate these experiences and spaces without um, fighting? It, it doesn't have to be a fight. Like it doesn't have to be um, a, a confrontation. And I think that's the space and that could question or could improve your um, your position as a leader. Um, I ha- That I have to put myself in check a lot. Like, okay, Umar, this is what you want to fix, but this is your end goal, but how you get there will determine um, a lot of, of uh, you know, the process will determine a lot. And uh, that that's the hard space to navigate because sometimes you want to yell, you want to, like, slap or think, like you have to put a smile on. I feel like, hey. <laughs> Creating safari doctors in your own school is a is a is a unique vision. How have you gone about sort of sharing those visions and bringing them to life? Um, we hmm, that's a good question. Um, one of the most basic things is with the kids. Like when we have conversations and they're like, "Yeah, well, Mama does safari doctors. I want to, you know, keep doing what you're doing when when you're older." When you, so, so just first is just within the home. Um, and especially with my dad, I think he's the most proud and he's always like checking in. Um, and then the beauty about it is that it just leads you to the next step to do something else. So like we just we just built the first um, semi-Olympic pool in, in Lamu County. And that for me is like bigger than anything because as an athlete, somebody who wanted to be an Olympian um, but couldn't because of the societal uh, restrictions on like – Whatever you do, it's like it's Safari Doctors now is running itself. We have the team, they have the, you know, they're doing the impact, and I'm just there as like a sounding board. And then moving on to now set up the school more substantially. And then what that gives you the leverage to do next. So I, that's the beauty I feel in the work that I do is like it's growth. Um, and it's not growth like a career growth of just watching yourself grow as an individual. It's growth of seeing, you know, Mariam who started as an office assistant who's now like a program manager. It's seeing Amina who came in as an intern who now can stand in for my panel sitting in Dubai and like at the biggest humanitarian conference. So, so that's, that's, I think, is the most satisfying um, uh, part of, uh, of seeing this impact that you're, you're talking about. And Umar, we see uh, curiosity is a word that uh, comes up a lot. And through curiosity, um, leaders like you approach their learning and development through being constantly curious. Does that resonate with you? It's um, it's, it's even stronger than curiosity. But what I love about the, the curiosity, I always remember, we're always told, curiosity killed a cat, curiosity killed a cat. And then one day, I don't know who it was, was like, yeah, and satisfaction brought it back. I was like, <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that's it. That's it. We're not stopping. We're going to poke our nose in everything. Um, but yeah, there is a, there's a curiosity and then there's like an intensity and love of life and possibilities as well. That kind of projects into that where you know there's more. You're hungry. Yeah, you're curious. It, it, curiosity, that hunger of um, um whether it's making a bigger impact or making a bigger, um, you know, uh, unlock, how do you put it? I don't even like the thing breaking glass ceilings because there's no ceilings really, but just kind of like really flying further and further out. But at the same time, being connected, having your roots deep. I, I always think of the analogy of a tree and how the roots are just as deep as the branches but you never really see that, but you cannot go that far out without going deeper down. So that's how the curiosity model should work. Beautifully said. Uh, communicating with clarity is something we see leaders are really conscious of. How have you gone about your uh, your communication? Hmm, a leader did a good job of giving us a survey at the beginning um, that we had to get out to our colleagues to find out if we are as phenomenal as we're supposed to be or as people like look um dupe us into thinking we are um we uh, so we came back that's that's the weakness actually that's my weakness and uh, they're like the feedback was that you know we we have these big visions we have a leader of big vision but 
how do we get there? Or maybe they're too warped up in your head that you're not translating it um, to the team that, that has to do it. So that's my problem. I also see it um, at home sometimes. And then I'd be like, oh, why is it done? And i but you didn't tell us it had to be done at a certain time. i was like, oh, <laughs> you know, when you say done, it has to be done immediately. So so that it makes you like think back. You're like, okay, maybe you, your brain is going um, on uh, 200 um, kilometers an hour, but then you need to translate that to who you need to get to that speed as well. Yeah, so communication, being clear, being um, um, thoughtful as well in uh, in how that should be delivered, like what the expectation is from from that. Um, uh, you, you're clear, and then upon being clear, it's also is the capacity there um, uh, to be able to deliver on what you're trying to communicate. And I appreciate you sharing that, isn't it? At the start of um, the elite process, I asked you to, to send out to all the people that you work with, the, you know, a couple or you know, as many as you like, and take on some feedback about your impact in your space and the fact that mm-hmm. that was something that you wanted to get better at and and, and some feedback your way on communicating mm-hmm. a little bit more clearly. It takes a bit of courage, we think, uh, to do that, but it, is that been something that's been beneficial then to say, how oh, I actually can put some work into that for you? That that was been that was very beneficial. It was also really helpful hearing the rest of the team and what all they needed to work on the feedback um, that they got from from the team because you're usually you're usually the one evaluating or getting feedback and you never do what you call that 360 evaluation which is something that um, we're looking at introducing in a healthy way in the organization um, which brought up the question I remember one of the breakout we always had a breakout session where every um, member kind of brought in what their hurdle was. And I remember after that, my hurdle was, you know, who leads the leader? And I was like, it, it's something that you take for granted. And it's a really dangerous space um, uh, to be in as well, because I get this feedback where it's like, okay, Umra, please communicate like clearly and how you communicate and, be, uh, and, um, and let us know what needs to be done because we're here to get stuff done. But my reaction, my being emotional um, about it is problematic. So that activity was really, really useful in just being like, okay, stop. You're doing this in one way. How is that being received? Um, It has to be a two-way street. Like leadership can be a one-way street. Umar, how important has collaboration been for you? Collaboration has been healthy. Healthy. It's like actually... I'm talking like physically, literally healthy, um, collaborate, um, allow everyone to be able to delegate and it's more effective. Um, uh, it's more, um, uh, practical and it's, it's just it's healthy. I'm, I'm, I'm talking like, especially like recently with Safari adopters being able to bring on board, let's say like a deputy director and evaluation person and like have, all these positions because before it felt like be, before uh, a leader and uh, learning about these leadership spaces, it felt like you're playing a football game with eight players and the eight players were not playing a passing game. So you can imagine somebody gets the ball, try to sprint, go score, nothing goes in. Some the next person is like, oh, I got this. I'm going to do it because I'm, you know, I, I want to deliver and I want to show. But then you're like, no, you have to collaborate or else we just all end up losing. Um, so, no, it's been really, it, we've gone into an 11 player team. And who has been the greatest leader in your life? She's. Wonder Woman. He's like, because, no, and it's not, I know it's stereotypical, like, oh, we've already like, oh, they love their mom. But um, my mom was literally a leader, like, professionally. Um, she was studying IT when people were not studying IT in the 80s. Um, she'd left two kids at home, and then she comes back to be this career woman, but at the same time knows how to balance with her social responsibilities as well being a wife being like a daughter being a mother and I, I think that's part of like a trade of leadership is how do you navigate your different roles and your different spaces and then the scariest thing I ever did was uh, look at her spreadsheet on how she leads and manages I'm talking like 
she keeps like two desktops and they're like all color coded and like, you know, who she's delegating to when she's following up. I'm like, whoa, I, I can barely like, you know, put things on my WhatsApp phone alerts. It's yeah. It was literally seeing how you can lead from the home to the community, to the career um, spaces. That was really impressive. And then she managed, she came on to manage our political campaign and she maps everything out. She puts like, it was literally like being in a, in a, in a war room and, and seeing that happen you know, that, and, and getting to see that firsthand and up close. There wasn't a hesitation for you. It was instantaneous, wasn't it? To have that in your life. And it's, uh, it's beautiful, isn't it? To have that influence that, and without knowing you at all, it sounds a lot like the life that you've lived. Can you see that in yourself? Oh, I wish I, maybe I have like um, a quarter of that discipline and uh, skill and sober headedness. Like if I was really generous, I'd say 33%. But <laughs> she, and, and when you ask leader, because the first is like, oh, that, that, you know, am I favoring? But I was like, wait a minute, this is like a, a factual, like when you're talking of leadership, when I look at the presentations that Stephanie gave us, you know, who's the person that comes close to um, to scoring a, a, an A plus on that? It's, yeah, it's definitely. And we get to use that until today. Like I get to use her as a sounding board. Like I said, when we were doing the campaign, um, a year and a half ago, she was the one who had like mapped out everything. She had like budgeted it, done all that stuff. So it's a resource that I still get to tap into. Well, we're obsessed with uh, collaboration and uh, what it means to get people together out of their silos and so much that you've achieved and I suspect so much more to come. Is there anyone that you thought, oh, I'd love to collaborate with, whether it's Safari Doctors or one of your other passions, it could be a hobby that you love. Is there a name you thought, oh, that's the person that I would love to collaborate with? Um, yeah. I, I, not an individual, but a field, definitely. I think a politician. An elected politician would be an interesting space. Someone who navigates the electorate and like delivering um, a mandate and it, it involves finances, it involves policies, it involves all of that. So and when I think of, um, I think of someone maybe like a, a Jacinda Arden, and especially what, you know, her having to, having a burnout and having to step out and knowing when to draw the line, balancing the gender um, aspect as well. So I'd really be curious to hear from like female politicians um, maybe I'm also biased in, in that space. And then the athletics is always um, a, a, a big space to, to learn about collaboration because it's all about team. And um, it's it just so, so like literal um, uh, when, when you think of it. So I w it would be interesting to, yeah, to unlock those two spaces. Well, Maritz, uh, feels you hard up to know that people are out there like you achieving what you're achieving in such a humble but brilliant way and to to share part of your story as i said it's been inspiring to hear it from afar and i've been looking forward to uh to this conversation and congratulations again on the amazing work that you continue to do and i really appreciate you taking the time to uh, to catch up today thank you thank you luke and have a good one 